Okay, great. Okay. Uh, for the second talk of the session, uh, we have Matteo Ippoliti talking about post-selection free entanglement dynamics via space-time duality. Okay, thank you. I want to thank you, the organizers of this workshop and the KIPP for, for putting this together. Uh, it's really exciting and um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, so this is based on a very new work that we hope to post this week. Um, and uh, the context, as, uh, you know, as, you, as you know, if you're tuning into this conference, is that of uh, Frontiers of Quantum Dynamics, um, which is becoming extremely, uh, extremely important now in light of the development of MISC devices, which are these noisy intermediate scale quantum um, platforms, which are offering these novel uh, lab systems with unprecedented levels of control and measurement capabilities, which are basically allowing us to probe a whole new range of questions. Uh, and these include translating concepts from familiar equilibrium uh, quantum mechanics, such as phases and universality into these uh, out of equilibrium uh, or open system settings, as well as uh, investigating the uh, foundations of, of quantum thermodynamics and the onset of quantum chaos, um, and uh, this range of questions about the simulability of quantum evolu of evolutions with either quantum systems or classical computers, which gets to questions of complexity uh, and quantum advantage. And a common thread through most of these questions is quantum entanglement, which is itself becoming an observable quantity uh, thanks to these uh, technological developments. Um, so. On the theory side, most of these developments uh, recently have come out of uh, random unitary circuits, which have proven to be a very versatile and flexible tool to study how entanglement is developed and, and, and spreads. And if you've tuned into the talks yesterday and, and earlier today, you know that there's a lot of interesting structure in entanglement if you broaden this phase from unitary circuits to unitary projective circuits, where you're also allowed to perform uh, projective measurements on, on your qubits. Uh, I'll also mention that you can also go into the opposite corner of the space. Uh, so instead of removing projective measurements, you can remove unitary gates. And quite surprisingly, you also get lots of interesting entanglement structure in these measurement only systems. Um, and finally, you can, uh, you know, you can further relax all of your assumptions and, and broaden this to the uh, widest possible scope to include, for example, weak measurements, uh, quantum channels that will model decoherence and, and so on. And this gets to both very fundamental questions about how, say, uh, classical physics emerges out of the rules of quantum mechanics, and also very practical applied questions about uh, MISC devices and achieving quantum advantage and so on. Okay, so now uh, I want to focus on these entanglement phases in, in unitary projective circuits, which you're probably already quite familiar with if you've tuned into the previous talks, but I'll just give a, uh, just refresh your memory. Um, so as you know, uh, if you consider a unitary circuit, such as the one shown, shown here, um, and, you, and you allow yourself to perform a projective measurement on each, on each one of these bonds, which represents your, your qubits uh, with a certain rate p, uh, you can uh, create this phase diagram where you have, for sufficiently uh, small measurement rate, you have a volume law entangled phase, sufficiently high rate, you have an area law entangled phase, and, uh, and you have a critical point that separates them. And I want to emphasize that in the past couple of years, we've learned a lot about this, but there are still lots of questions that we uh, don't fully know the answers to, uh, both for the phases and for the transition that separates them. So in particular, for the volume of phase, we don't fully understand the nature of this quantum matter correcting code, um, as, as Michael was, was mentioning earlier, uh, particularly in Clifford models, there are these subleading entropy terms that are really quite mysterious um, for now. Um, on the ILO side, you might think that there could be relations to uh, equilibrium phases, which, as we know, in many cases have ILO entanglement. So perhaps there could be a you know, useful way of assigning uh, concepts of order and phases to these non-equilibrium uh, steady states. And as for the transition, of course, we don't really know all the possible universality classes uh, that could arise and, and which conformal field theory uh, describes them. We have lots of evidence that there is a CFT for all of these models, but um, we don't really know what it is. So um, now I want to emphasize the main problem that I'm going to try to address in this talk, and that's the problem of post-selection, which really gets in the way if you're trying to uh, access this physics experimentally. Um, so entanglement is, is itself something that's a bit tricky to measure because uh, say you want to measure the second Rennie entropy, which is uh, the easiest, you want to measure trace of the density matrix squared. 
And naively, that's something you can't do because observables are linear in the, in the state of the system. However, there are tricks you can play. Uh, so for this, for this purity, you can measure uh, an observable, which is a, a swap, on a state which is uh, the tensor product of two identical copies of the same state. So if you can do that, uh, you, can actually, you can actually measure the entanglement. And this has been done in experiment before. However, if you're now dealing with uh, dynamics that involve projective measurement, this becomes very hard. And the reason is that even, you know, even if you try to produce the same state twice in these two runs, A and B, you set up exactly the same uh, unitary gates, let's even neglect control errors, uh, and you set up your measurements in exactly the same locations, you're going to get some outcomes from your measurements which are intrinsically random. And this is just the randomness built into quantum mechanics uh, and, and it's inevitable. So let's say that for the first run in, in this measurement over here, you're going to obtain a spin up. In the second measurement, you're going to obtain a spin down. And in this third measurement, maybe you'll obtain a spin down again. As you run the same exact protocol again on a different subsystem, you may uh, initially be lucky and obtain the, the same outcomes, but eventually you run out of luck and you get two different outcomes for the two different runs of your experiment. And at that point, uh, Basically, you have two different states. Uh, there's no ge general way of undoing that, and you have to throw away your second copy and start over, which gives you uh, an exponential overhead in, in the size and depth of your circuit, which makes this very challenging. So if you've listened to, to Michael's talk, you know that there are actually ways around this. So one way is to consider, rather than measuring the entropy of the whole state, focusing on this local order parameter, which features, you know, you, then you can leverage locality to basically condition on fewer measurement outcomes, which is uh, a lot, a lot easier. Uh, and, and furthermore, if you have a model which is uh, classically simulable, then you can run basically your quantum experiment alongside a classical simulation, use feedback, and um, and basically uh, fix any wrong measurement outcome and obtain your, your two copies of the state. However, this is somewhat uh, constraining, and it would be great to have more direct access to the dynamics of entanglement to the extent possible. So in this talk, I will present a new way of realizing the output states of a broad class of non-unitary circuits. And these are all circuits which are space-time duals of unitary circuits, which I'll define in a moment. And this method avoids the problem of post-selection entirely, and it gives you direct access to the purity uh, that is the, associated to the entanglement entropy of either the whole system or arbitrary subsystems of it. And you obtain that as a, a peculiar correlation function in, in an associated unitary evolution. Good, so let me introduce this concept of space-time duality, which is a, is a fancy word for a very simple concept. So imagine you have a, a two-qubit unitary gate that I'm showing here. And it has, there is an error of time, so there are two inputs, A and B, and two outputs, C and D. You can choose to view the same gate, so the same exact uh, entries in the matrix, but with a flipped error of time, uh, going left to right, for example. And in this case, your inputs are C and A, and your outputs are D and B, for example. Um, and the gate you obtain in that way, uh, U twiddle, is genetically not unitary. So I'll give you an example. Consider your entity. Uh, which you know, we all know the entries of the identity matrix. You can also represent it as these two qubit word lines, which are entering your, your gate and simply moving forward without talking to each other. Uh, if you flip it on its side, um, it turns out that the uh, particular reshuffling of entries gives you this matrix here, which has uh, rank one because it only has one independent column. And um, up to a factor, this is a projector on this bad pair state, zero, zero, plus one, one. Um, represented diagrammatically, this, this gives you um, these two word lines that um, basically the bottom one represents the two qubits entering the gate and annihilating each other, and then the, the upper one represents the creation of, of a new uh, bad pair state that's, that's moving forward in time. So this highlights the fact that um, the dualized gates that you obtain in this way don't have to be unitary. In this particular case, you got something like a projective measurement, but more generally, you would get something like a weak measurement, something intermediate between a projector and a unitary gate. And I want to emphasize, because this would be crucial for um, the rest of the talk, that um, these are forced measurements. So everything you've learned about uh, Born probabilities and quantum measurement doesn't really apply here. We're not, uh, there's no probability distribution out of which we are sampling an outcome. Uh, these measurements always yield the same projector. 
Okay, so just to uh, highlight the fact that this doesn't come out of nowhere, um, these, these dualized gates or these um, dual unitary gates have been uh, used recently in various settings, um, particularly in dynamics where you can consider a, a special class of unitary gates where uh, their duals are also unitary, which are called dual unitary gates. And these have allowed uh, the first exact connection between uh, a microscopic model and the emergence of, of random matrix theory and quantum chaos being advantage of this uh, spatial evolution associated to the time evolution. Uh, and these models are, are highly constrained and give you uh, some uh, great level of analytical control over, say, correlations, out of time order correlators, uh, entanglement spreading, and so on and so forth. Also, on the uh, more, um, let's say, computer science side, uh, complexity side, uh, this has been recently used to basically uh, prove that two plus one dimensional shallow circuits can be efficiently simulable by, again, by taking advantage of flipping the gates and essentially evolving sideways. So, okay, so what do we want to use this uh, space-time duality for? We want to study the, the problem of purification dynamics, which Michael just uh, introduced earlier. Um, so again, to, to remind you, we are starting with the maximally mixed state, rho, in, rho input is proportional to the density and we're acting on it with some um, hybrid circuit, which could, could contain unitary gates, projective measurements, possibly weak measurements, and so on. And the output state is proportional to M, M dagger, where M is your, uh, is your circuit, and it doesn't have to be the identity. So if M is unitary, then clearly these two, uh, you know, M, M dagger cancel, you get identity again, which makes sense, you haven't purified anything, but more generally, you look at something with less entropy than the input you sent in. So it turns out that there are, uh, this problem gives rise to purification phases and transition, transitions between them, which are maybe I shouldn't say equivalent, but are closely related to the, to the entanglement phases for the pure state evolution. And in particular, you have a pure phase, which is associated to the area of phase, uh, where your input state goes from maximally mixed to pure in a very short time scale, either order one or logarithmic in system size. Um, you then have a mixed phase, which is associated to the volume law phase, where your state stays mixed for an extremely long time, exponential in system size, and these phases are separated by critical points in which purification takes time polynomial in, in system size. And in particular, these critical points appear to have z equals to one, so, so this is actually linear in, in system size. And when I say purifies, um, we always mean um, we're looking at the purity, so this trace of the output state squared, which you can represent as this diagram here. So there are two copies of the, of the output matrix row, and they're contracted in this fashion here. Good, so this is just recapping what I just told you. We have a, the output of a hybrid circuit. We can calculate its, its uh, purity in this way. And then I just want to uh, show the same diagram in a different way by, I, I'm not doing any physical operation. I'm just, uh, you know, sort of uh, drawing the diagram differently. But this will become useful if we now study the case in which this matrix M, that's, that's, that's our hybrid circuit, is actually the space-time dual of an associated unitary matrix, unitary circuit, I should say. Um, in that case, there is a physical error of time that comes into play that goes, let's say, uh, bottom to top here. And that means that this whole diagram that, I, that I've drawn here consists of unitary evolution on the left, unitary evolution on the right, and something strange happening in the middle that I will characterize in a moment. But the, the, the message is that this one diagram gives you th these two things, which therefore had to be equal. And one of them is the purity of the output of this hybrid circuit. And the other is this uh, particular correlation function on, on an associated unitary circuit that has this spatially bipartite structure. Great, so now I'm going to uh, get into some detail about this and it's going to get a bit technical, so I apologize, but bear with me for, for a couple of minutes and I hope this will all make sense. Okay, so just as a reminder, here is the diagram we are trying to study. And also up here, I'm showing you the, um, a reminder of, of what happened when we flipped the identity, which gave us this, uh, you know, first a measurement on this Bell state, and then the initialization again of that Bell state going forward in time. So here, if we, um, here I'm just, you know, showing you the same diagram in the, in the upper left, just expanded as an actual circuit with the usual brickwork connectivity. And we can examine it starting from the bottom, where we have, um, in this central central bond of the, of the you know, imagine it's a 1D uh, qubit chain, 
and there is a central bond which is special and it starts out with these two um, arcs with upwards concavity which based on on this means that you are initializing a projector onto that particular bell state zero zero plus one one everywhere else on your qubit chain so to the left and right of the central bond you are initializing the maximally mixed state or the infinite temperature state which is represented by these little loops connecting uh, these two layers of the tensor network so basically the bra and the cat and this gives you a uh, single qubit identity matrix okay then on the final temporal slice this is basically uh, symmetrical so on the central bond you're projecting onto the, the same bell state and on all the other qubits are doing nothing so if you if you do a local measurement um and on, on a subset of your qubits and you don't look at the others what that enforces is basically this tracing out, which gives you this particular connectivity of the tensor network. So there's nothing, nothing uh, special going on there. Good, so that addresses sort of the temporal boundaries. And then in the bulk, uh, everything on the left and right is just unitary, so nothing special there. And on the central bond, you're, you're repeatedly um, projecting onto that bell state and reinitializing your two qubits into that same bell state over and over again. Good, so this, is, uh, this can sound a bit complicated, so I'm going to summarize it as an operational protocol that you could run on your favorite quantum simulator. Uh, and that entails initializing the state, which is again, this bell pair on a central uh, pair of qubits surrounded by maximally mixed states. And then iterating this process where you measure on, you perform a bell measurement, and whenever you obtain a wrong outcome, which, by which I mean something that isn't this one state, zero, zero, plus one, one, but one of the other three possible outcomes of, of a bell measurement, then you have to stop your protocol and record a failure. And I'm going to explain in a second what I mean by that. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you're successful for T time steps in a row and you make it all the way to the end, repeatedly measuring the correct state, then you can record a success for your protocol. And this leaves you basically with a, you know, you can tabulate all these values and you have, you know, the number of total runs, the number of runs that were successful all the way to the end, those that were successful until the next to last step and so on and so, so forth. You can keep track of all of these uh, numbers. And what do you do with that? So what I'm going to say is that um, this particular measurement protocol gives you access to the purification dynamics of a number of qubits equal to 2t that exists on a temporal slice of your circuit, in the, basically in the dualized circuit, and are evolving for a time t. So to, to, to give you an example, this little diagram here corresponds to t equals to three, because there are three time steps. There are three um, bell measurements that are represented by these downward concavity arcs, one, two, and three. And it basically um, simulates this purification dynamics on six qubits that have numbered from one to six on, on this right side. Same, th same thing on the left side. These are the two copies of, of the output state row. Um, and they're evolving for, for time t. Um, here the convention is that just half of a brickwork layer is one time step, but it's not, not so important. Um, great, so, so practically then your measurement, so this counting of successful uh, runs of your protocol over the number of total runs gives you directly this trace of row square. The, out, the, the purity of the output state of this associated uh, hybrid circuit. Okay, so, so that was a lot. So I'm gonna give you, uh, you know, a few seconds to, to digest. And um, I'm going to comment on uh, what, what you should expect out of this. So because you're repeatedly measuring the central qubits and, and basically um, there is one right outcome and several wrong outcomes, you might expect that there is some probability of failure at every time step, and that um, these probabilities will, uh, you know, your probability of success will multiply and, and therefore decay exponentially to zero over time. But if that's the case, that means that your purity is also decaying exponentially, which means that your second Rennie entropy is actually extensive in system size, because T is proportional to the uh, spatial extent of your, of your dual system. And that gives you direct access to the entropy density of your output state, which ends up being one over two tau, where tau is your um, exponential decay uh, time constant. So if you have a good enough quantum simulator where you can resolve enough data points of this decay to do an exponential fit, you basically have direct access to the entropy density of, of the mixed phase, which is, I think, very striking. Good, so a few more comments. Um, 
you may, may be a bit confused about um, the matter of post selection because I just told you that you have to perform a sequence of measurements and whenever some whenever you don't like some outcome, you have, you're supposed to throw away the, the, the realization. However, that's not post-selection because these failed runs are actually contributing to increment this denominator n total, which, which appears in the, in the quantity you're trying to measure. And so that, that's, that's crucial information. You can't, um, you know, you need it to, to perform your measurement. So that's, that's different from post-selection. Uh, an equivalent way of saying that is that these unitary circuits on the left and right are automatically preparing the same state. That is true up to control letters, which are just a fact of life and, and going to be there in every realistic implementation. But there's no fundamental quantum mechanics reason why it's hard to get to get the same state on, on both sides. OK, um, another thing is that um, obviously this does not let you access whatever model you want, because this constraint of being dual to a unitary circuit is, is, um, is non-trivial. However, it does give you access to a wide class of hybrid circuits, and it's exactly as big as the space of all unitary circuits because there is this one-to-one -one duality. So that's a big space, and presumably there's lots of interesting physics in it. Um, also, this comes, you know, the, the, the causal light cone of, of your measurements enforces uh, a maximum uh, temporal duration of revolution. So you can, you know, if you have two t qubits on the slice, they can be evolved for time up to t, no more than that. So that's a constraint test intrinsic into this, this strategy. And also remark on the fact that the state, the output state of this hybrid circuit is never uh, prepared all at once in space. Uh, it doesn't exist on your system on, on a spatial slice, you never get a snapshot of it. It exists on a temporal slice that, that is essentially played out over time on one particular qubit that sits at the edge. However, uh, you, you know, if, if you don't like this and, or, or if you want to use this for say actually coding or, or as a quantum memory, you could unfold this temporal slice into a spatial slice with, with you know, with some ancillas and, and some swap gates. So it's it's not complicated. Good. So that was the main. Uh, those were the main messages I wanted to to get to. Um, I'll uh, from here on out, I'm going to try to focus on on some phenomenology and, and actual models to to show show you what we can get with this. So the first model, you know, the model we've looked at is um, is a Clifford circuit. Uh, obviously, we choose it for because it's efficiently simulable, and we pick two parameters, two probabilities, p and j, um, that select, you know, uh, the, the 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 frequency of these different um, two qubit Clifford gates that you are allowed to to apply. So p sets the probability of applying to entity, which again dualizes to a bell measurement, whereas uh, in the other cases, you, you pick one of, these, one of these two gates, which are dual unitary, so they flip to themselves. They happen to be uh, equal to their, to their space-time duals. And um, basically, you can interpret P as a measurement rate for this reason, and J uh, selects how likely you are to pick uh, you know, this non-interacting swap gate, which only uh, you know, changes the position of qubits without letting them interact, or this I swap, which also applies a control Z gate, which is um, basically an Ising ZZ interaction. Uh, so you have these two knobs, a measurement rate and an interaction rate, and you can see what kind of uh, phase diagram you get. And um, so this is, these are the results of numerical simulations using the stabilizer method uh, up to 4,000 uh, qubits. And you can extract the entropy density of your final state, um, evolved you know, on, on 2t qubits, evolved for time t, and uh, this is what you find, find for the entropy density. And this is quite striking. The phase diagram that uh, this represents basically looks like this, which is a very unusual phase diagram for a measurement problem I want to emphasize. Um, so we have a mixed phase basically everywhere in the bulk for any measurement rate less than one and any interaction strength greater than zero. And then we have these two special, special lines. Um, this p equals to one line um, is uh, basically uh, you know, it's a, it's a pure phase, but I don't really call, don't, don't want to call it a phase because really it's, it's unstable to infinitesimal perturbations. It's um, it's really just a special circuit where you're only acting with that entity over and over again, and in the transverse direction that gives you um, dimerized belt pairs in your final state deterministically. So that's a pure state, but it's kind of not not very robust. Um, the critical line is somewhat more interesting, and I'll uh, focus on that next. 
So again, that has a zero entropy density, but it turns out to have a divergent amount of entropy. And you can understand it by thinking of, um, you know, if you set J equals to zero, and then you have a swap circuit, so you only have two, opera two operations that you can apply. One of them is the identity, the other is the swap. So Q is not really inter. Okay, great, thanks. I'll, I'll uh, yeah. go over this and then, and then wrap up. Um, great, so you have qubits that move around in space-time, and they're never allowed to interact. So they're coming in through, through this uh, row input, input state of the hybrid dynamics, as maximally mixed qubits. And then they can um, you know, either go out in the same initial state, or they can go out in the output state, depending on uh, the particular sequence of, of uh, swaps and identities that you, that you act with. So um, basically, there are two kinds of, of word lines you need to focus on to, to calculate the entropy of the output state. And one of them is this, uh, this red one, where you have a bell pair state that connects two qubits uh, in the output state. That means that you have two qubits that are maximally entangled to each other and completely disentangled from the rest of the universe. So they contribute zero entropy to the final state. And again, I'm talking about entropy between the whole system and the rest of the world. So not about the, the uh, subsystems of, of the output state. Um, the other case is this green one where you have a maximally mixed qubit that's coming in from the environment and it's making it all the way into the output state here. And in that case, basically, it means that one of your output qubits is in a maximally mixed state, or you can think of it as being in a bell pair state with some other qubit that exists outside of your system. So that will contribute one bit of entropy. So then the entropy calculation becomes a counting of how many word lines you have that make it all the way into the, the temporal slice where the output state lives. But that's a, a pretty simple problem because these word lines are essentially undergoing a random walk. And so um, these qubits are undergoing diffusion in the horizontal direction. And so uh, the only ones that have a shot at making it into the output state are the ones that start within uh, order square root of t of, of the surface. So that they can diffuse uh, and, and, uh, and be part of the output state. So the result of this is that the purity decays stretched, stretched exponentially in time. This is to be compared with the mixed phase where it decayed um, exponentially. So here, again, this would be measurable by the protocol. You would find a, a decay that where your attempt at fitting to, a, to, a, um, to an exponential decay time constant would yield uh, zero as, as time goes on, so vanishing entropy density. Great, so there are various, a few more things you can do that I'm just going to uh, skip over, but basically with some tricks you can uh, access subsystem purities, uh, not just the purity of the whole of the whole system. Uh, and you can use this to access quantum code properties of the mixed phase. And here, you know, the main concern one could have is uh, how special are these phases? Are they so special that you lose all the interest, interest in physics? And the answer seems to be no. You have these various power laws that emerge in the neutral information and in the quantum code distance of, of uh, mixed phase. So, so they appear to be uh, legitimate, you know, instances of the of the mixed phase. So, okay. So then, I'll, uh, this brings me to the conclusion. Um, basically, I've illustrated this uh, method that uses space-time duality to to implement forced measurements and entirely sidestep the issue of pot selection. This gives you a new route to investigate a broad class of hybrid circuits. Uh, it lets you access global and subsystem purity. Uh, which could be used to, to access quantum code properties in this phase. Uh, and it also gives rise to this class of dynamics that people haven't, you know, that people are starting to focus on, um, but in a new light, sort of, it, it poses interesting constraints on these hybrid circuits you can get from dualizing unitary circuits. And finally, this is, I've applied this to the uh, problem of um, unitary plus measurement circuits, but uh, there's nothing forcing you to do that. You could use this for other questions, uh, for probing entanglement dynamics in different setups. So thank you. Uh, again, this is going to appear hopefully this week. And I want to thank uh, Michael Gallans, David Hughes, and Sarango Palakrishnan for uh, discussions. I'll leave up, leave up the conclusions, I guess. Thank you. Zedeka, you're muted. Oh yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, any any questions for Matteo?
we'll get us started while people think. Um, can you comment a little bit more on the uh, on the properties of the quantum code that you get? Sure. Yes, thank you. So these quantum codes are, um, you know, we know from other models that they're not strict, strictly speaking good codes in the sense that Michael was was outlining earlier in that they have um, they have a finite rate, but their distance, which is the size of the smallest logical operator, is not extensive. It, it's divergent, but sub extensive. So that's a strange um, power law property of, 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 this, of this phase that we don't fully understand yet. And this shows up in these models as well. However, it's a bit more, it, it, it's, it's a bit more interesting maybe because uh, the particular boundary conditions you, you've, you've enforced were basically near the boundaries uh, you know, you have this, this causal light cone, and near the boundaries, the qubits have taken part in, in the dynamics for a very short amount of time. Basically, there you have a very poor code. You have a distance of order one. It's you're not hiding any information from anyone, um, which which makes sense. However, so this is this case on the left here, where you, are, you have a subsystem near the edge. However, if you move to the to the bulk, then you get you recover basically the familiar phenomenology where. Um, as you increase the system size, there is a bigger and bigger region where uh, local measurements won't tell you anything about encoded information. Um, and also, you can you can ask about the mutual information of the state, um, or equivalently the stabilizer length distribution, which describes again the kind of um, spatial entanglement structure in the state. And we know that at critical points we have this decay as one over s squared. However, deep into the, the mixed phase, uh, this power law is not, like it, it appears to be smaller than two, and we recover this here as well, where if you compare the slope of the L to the minus two with, with the actual data, uh, they're sort of converging. So, so this is, um, it's unclear whether this agrees with the 0 0.38 from Matthew Fisher's uh, talk, but it's sort of somewhere in the neighborhood. Thanks. Uh, Thomas Schuster, could you uh, unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, I was wondering, so you have this like duality between the sort of circuit that looks like you're performing measurements and the sideways one where it's a unitary circuit. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering um, the purification entropy in the sort of measurement based orientation, uh, mm -hmm. how does it relate to properties of that sideways unitary? Like, is it related to OTOCs of the unitary or something else? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, that's an excellent question. So let's say one thing. So if you have, uh, let me go back to a diagram. Um, so if you have any scrambling at all in your unitary circuit, then you are repeatedly injecting a bell pair somewhere. And this bell pair is, is going to scramble away and just becomes grow into some large operator and basically never return. It's going to function something like a Markovian bath. So then at every time that you have some probability of measuring uh, a random state and you get a, 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 and that leads you directly to a volume law to, to, a, to a mixed phase in the where the purification is decaying exponentially. So the only cases where you don't get that outcome are cases in which you have some deterministic refocusing on your bad pair at some later time um, mm -hmm. of which basically this uh, critical phase here is a, is a special case, right? You've got these word lines and at late times uh, you're more and more likely to recover an exact bad pair that you've seeded before. Um, so I would say, I, I, I guess it's a great question whether there are um, quantitative connections between, say, the value of the OTOX and, and uh, entropy density in that mixed phase. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it, it's clear that if you do have scrambling, then you are in the mixed phase. Uh, and anything else requires some sort of fine tuning. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Masaki, could you unmute yourself and ask? Oh. Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, very interesting talk. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. So, so I'm particularly interested in this construction using space-time dual. And mm -hmm. uh, you, perhaps I missed your explanation, but uh, you said uh, for broad class of hybrid circuit, this construction can be applied. But how general is it if you give me some random Problem or hybrid circuit, what is the chance that you can apply? Right, this right. Um, I mean, I would say it's it's a measure zero subset of hybrid circuits, right? It's a it's a it's a strong constraint. Uh, when I say it's a broad class, I just want to mean that they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with unitized circuits. So, 
So it's not that fine tuned. It's you've got you've got plenty of choices. However, if you if you you know take take Matthew Fisher's model where there are single qubit measurements, that cannot be replicated in this way because the single qubit measurements uh, remain single qubit measurements. So you're never going to I shouldn't say never, but like it, it appears you know at face value mm. you can't convert them into into unitary gates. Um, so so in all of these models that we do, the measurements are bell pair measurements. So that's already a, a, a constraint. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's a there's a question in the chat from Abhinav Deshpande. He does he prefers not to unmute himself, so I read it out. Um, how do the methods here compare to the series of works by Elbin Vermesh Zoller et al., where they make randomized measurements and use the statistical correlations among them to estimate, among other things, the purity? I, I don't know. Um, I think that um, those works that uh, that that he mentioned probably probably falls somewhere along the lines of, of, of these things that, that Michael was saying, where you have, um, you have your evolution, you have measurement records, and you can try to do the best you can with sort of decoding uh, this, the state you have from, from the outcomes. I'm not familiar with those works though. So, so, uh, so I, I would say it's probably a different um, approach to the problem than the one we're taking here. Other questions? So, Matei, you mentioned in your talk about um, how you could take this state from the time-like slice and kind of still get it. How, 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 do, you, uh -huh. how do you do that? That's right. Um, yeah, so... So let me have a diagram. There we go, yeah. So this here is one half of your protocol, uh, say the left half, uh, because at this level, maybe you're not interested in calculating the purity on the fly, but you just want to produce one copy of the state and, and store it for, for later use. So you have one half of your, of your uh, protocol here, and the other half of your subsystem you would want to initialize in, in bell pair states, dimerized bell pairs. In this way here on the bottom and then you just act with a swap circuit in the entire right half of your space time and this basically takes the output of, of of the hybrid circuit and just kind of reflects it almost geometrically onto some spatial slice where you will eventually have to reconstruct it because it comes in off shuffled so if you have your qubits numbered you know one two three four five and six on your slice they end up you know all the odd ones on the left even ones on the right uh, and out of order but then you can act with a further sequence of swaps and, and reconstruct it. So there is nothing fundamentally tough about this, it's just kind of uh, some overhead on, on, on gates that you need to add on. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tibor, can you unmute yourself and ask? Oh, I didn't have a question, but I just wrote a comment to the previous question, just oh, saying okay. that I think those works they don't deal with having to do measurements or, or like these hybrid circuits. They just think about unitary dynamics. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the, in the, uh, this is in response to Zolo et al. Yeah, exactly. I see. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good point. But, you know, in some sense here, you're also doing unitary dynamics or is it, or do you want to think of this as yeah. non-unitary in some sense? Yeah, I guess mm -hmm. you want to think of it as non-unitary um, in the transverse direction, right? You, you do have this purification dynamics, so. Yeah, you have this step where you sort of, you you do measurements in between the copies. So it's, I think it's not exactly unitary dynamics in the sense of the result. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right, so I guess, um, in, Sorry, uh, in, in this protocol here, you know, you produce the state and there are actually no measurements. So, you know, maybe there could be some connection that one could try to sort out.
Okay, other questions? Is, is there a way for you to control um, uh, the how? Because you know you, you showed how the identity goes into the Bell projective measurement. Is there a way for you to control the strength of the measurements in the transverse in the flip direction? Right. That's a that's an interesting question. Of course, if you wanted to more broadly explore this <clears throat> space of, of possible things you can do. Um, so generally, if you flip flip a unitary gate, you get some you get some generic matrix which doesn't have any special properties. It's not Hermitian, not unitary, it's not anything in particular. However, you can uh, do a polar decomposition on it where you write it as a product of a unitary times a, a positive semi-definite Hermitian matrix, um, and then clearly the unitary part is is unitary, so 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 it doesn't characterize your measurement strength. Everything uh, will sit into the semi-positive definite part of it. Um, and so basically looking at the distribution of eigenvalues of that uh, positive semi-definite matrix will, will characterize how strong your measurement is. So, so a rank one projector will have one singular value, which is two in this case, and then zero, zero, zero on the, on the orthogonal space. Um, a, unit, a dual unitary matrix will have um, singular values that are identically one. And you know, in between you'll have, probably you can use the um, sort of the, the dispersion of these eigenvalues as a, as a knob to tune your measurement strength from no measurement all the way to projector. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that could be an additional, you know, you could build a much bigger parameter space by playing with this. Yeah. Um, uh, Adam has a weak Wi-Fi, so I'll read out his question. Uh, could you show again which vertices are allowed in your loop model? This is from Adam Nahum. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so yeah, this loop model is very closely related to the loop model by Adam and, and by Skinner on uh, free fermion uh, measurements, except instead of the, um, you know, you have a swap instead of the other vertex they have. So, so their, their, ver their model maps onto this loop percolation, this one maps onto random walks. So you have just, just this one identity uh, vertex and this one uh, swap vertex. And uh, both of them take two inputs from the past and take them into the future. So basically these, these walks are oriented, you know, bottom to top, you can't ever turn around. This gives you this random walk structure. Okay. Um, any last questions or should we go into the break breakout rooms? Okay, uh, could the, yeah, okay, so the breakout rooms are now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you, Michael. Um, let's give a hand to both speakers.